Hello, I'm Kamal Santa Maria, and this is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, oil. The United States has declared zero tolerance over anyone buying Iranian oil. So as the US slams the brakes on oil exports from the Islamic Republic, we'll look at the spillover effect for the global economy. Also this week, the secret world of high-risk money lending. There's been a boom in loans to poorer countries in the past decade. We'll see how the people there could be at risk in our case study from Mozambique. Plus, unbreakable glass, mysteriously shattered, and a sting operation to catch a spy. That's how competitive the world of mobile communications has become, as the vested interests and players jockey for control. So we are looking at the oil markets this week, one of those economic factors which affects almost everywhere in the world, regardless of the politics behind it. And right now, the politics are all about Iran. The United States has demanded all countries stop buying Iranian oil or they will face sanctions. Now, Iran exports slightly more than a million barrels a day, with the majority going to China, India, South Korea, Japan and Turkey. And some of those customers, especially China and Turkey, are not happy. More on the global impact in a moment after this report from Rosalind Jordan in Washington. The U.S. says its efforts to impose a worldwide embargo on Iranian oil is already working. In the last 11 months, the Trump administration says Iran has lost about $10 billion in oil revenue. All this, says Washington, to punish Tehran for what it calls the government's, quote, malign ways. The Trump administration and our allies are determined to sustain and expand the maximum economic pressure campaign against Iran to end the regime's destabilizing activity threatening the United States, our partners and allies, and security in the Middle East. These demands are not just coming from the United States government and many of our allies and partners. They are similar to what we hear from the Iranian people themselves. The U.S. imposed oil sanctions on Iran in May 2018 after it withdrew from what President Donald Trump called the ineffective Iran nuclear deal. The U.S. wanted to cut off Iran's ability to support Hezbollah and Houthi fighters, as well as send aid to governments in Syria and Venezuela. Last fall, when oil supplies were tight, the U.S. gave several countries permission to wrap up their existing Iranian oil purchases by no later than May 2nd. But now, the U.S. says supplies are plentiful, and so the five countries still importing Iranian crude, China, India, Turkey, Japan, and South Korea, no longer have a reason to keep buying from Tehran. To conduct these transactions, one almost always needs to participate in the financial markets, and we intend to enforce the sanctions. We don't lay out sanctions that we don't have any intention of uh, encouraging countries to cooperate with. Analysts say it's important to look at the impact sanctions could have on ties between the U.S. and other countries. For example, how sanctions could derail current Chinese-American trade talks. But analysts say it's just as important to consider why the White House considers Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates and not other oil-producing nations key to making the Iranian embargo work. I think that actually feeds into this narrative of this very close uh, relationship that the President Trump has with the Saudi royal family. And of course, the United States is, uh, again, this is the president who's, who looks at issues from a transactional standpoint. State Department officials won't say just how soon after May 3rd that the U.S. will impose sanctions on countries still buying oil from Iran, but they are adamant. They say the only way to get Iran to change its behavior is by imposing an embargo. And the only way to make certain that the embargo works is to impose sanctions on other countries, even if those countries happen to be the U.S.'s friends. Rosalind Jordan, Al Jazeera, the State Department. So let's examine the economics of all this, because supply and demand is key to understanding oil's spillover effect for the global economy. Now, OPEC and the big producers, they always want the prices to stay just at that sweet spot, high enough to keep them in business, low enough, though, to keep the demand ticking over. And at the moment, the trade data suggests Iran's customers will be able to bridge any supply gap. The United States has also reassured the market, yes, any gap in global oil production will be well supplied. Saudi Arabia, for its part, says it won't raise oil output immediately. Actually, there's an OPEC deal with Russia in place to cut production. 
but that could be revised as soon as June when the cartel meets. But there are supply constraints as well, places like Venezuela and Libya, of course, due to internal conflicts. Iran has threatened, as it often does, to block the Strait of Hormuz, the major oil shipping route in the Gulf. The upshot of all this is that Brent crude, the global oil benchmark, is up around 40% since November. So if supply fears do start to re-emerge, that could send oil prices even higher. We're going to talk about this all with Jamil Ahmad joining us from Kuala Lumpur. He is the Global Head of Currency, Strategy and Market Research at FXTM Market. It's great to have you with us, uh, Jamil. So all these countries, the likes of China, South Korea, Japan, Turkey, they are going to have to do without Iranian oil, uh, at least for the foreseeable future. The United States says, don't worry, there's plenty of oil around the place. Do you agree with that? Well, there certainly is a lot of different oil producers, but what I would do is liken this to a different scenario. Let's say Iran is Tottenham Hotspur, and the football team has now lost its best striker, Harry Kane. The best striker for Iranian economy and for its supply is actually oil. So all of these other countries involved, China, India, the waivers total to eight different nations. They are now without the oil supply from Iran when these waivers expire at the beginning of May. Now, there is enough oil elsewhere, places like Russia, United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, they can supply that oil. However, it will take some time. And this is why investors have priced in a higher oil valuation. Oil has touched its highest level of 2019, and it does look like the rally in the oil markets will continue a bit further yet. And what about the effect on Iran? Uh, We already know US sanctions being in place. Uh, This is exactly what the slowly recovering Iranian economy won't need. So if you turn the taps off on the oil market, the Iranian economy will suffer. Since those sanctions, economic sanctions put back in place in May 2018, we've seen the Iranian real crumble like a biscuit. Inflation has rocketed sky high. There's already pressures on the Iranian economy that is going to see a recession of at least 4%, according to the IMF, in 2019. Now that it has been confirmed that these sanctions on Iranians' best export oil will be turned off as of next month. We expect this recession to extend even further, looking at a recession beyond 4%. The Iranian real will remain under pressure, and it will also increase those Iranian inflationary pressures, which is very bad news indeed for the local consumers on the streets. Right, so the Iranians will, rightly you would say, feel aggrieved about the situation that they find themselves in. Who is or who might stand up for them, allies-wise, people who are willing to take on the United States in some way, shape or form and say, no, we will continue to do our business? Well, the nation that is known to import the most oil from Iran is China. So you would look at the side of China towards whether it could potentially stand up for Iran in this situation. But I don't see this happening for this reason. U.S. and China trade tensions and those trade negotiations that have been going on in the background now for most of a year... Now, the United States and China are very close to a new trade agreement. If you check the narrative from both sides of the Chinese authorities and the United States authorities, investors have become optimistic that a trade agreement is close, which is extremely good news for the global economy. Mm. If there was a standing up for Iran in this example, hypothetically, this would put those that progress on the back burner. So for this reason, I do not think there will be somebody that stands up. It's probably going to be accepted, in my opinion, that those producers or those importers of oil will look for oil elsewhere. Let me throw another country into the mix, and that is Turkey. Not so much in the sense of we've been talking about standing up for Iran, but the effect on Turkey as well, an economy that has struggled itself. It's uh, currency has been struggling in the last, well, year or so, really. What about the effect on Turkey? This is extremely bad news for the Turkish economy, for its markets and for its currency. It means that Turkey will now need to look for another supplier of oil at a time where its financial conditions are not great. Probably, in my opinion, we will see weakness in the Turkish lira. But there's other currencies and economies out there that will benefit from this news. I will mention Russia Mm. and the Russian ruble. Russia is one of the biggest producers of oil. It can actually supply this gap and the Russian ruble will strengthen on higher oil prices. 
You started with a, a football analogy, something which a lot of people can understand. I again want to bring this all back to something people will understand, because we've talked a lot about separate economies, but people all over the world, when they think about higher oil prices, they think about higher fuel prices, they think about taxes on uh, aviation industry, all these sorts of things. Are these things which people need to keep an eye on, or have we sort of gotten used to things being just that bit higher? Well, when it comes to inconsistency, the verbal narrative and the social media narrative in particular that comes from President Trump. He wants lower oil prices. However, this news actually strengthens oil prices because of the tighter oil markets, because the Iranian oil supply has been cut. Now, everybody knows and is aware of the need for oil prices to move lower. The global economy is struggling and it's facing headwinds in 2019. There is a multitude of different external challenges. So the longer term picture is actually that oil prices should come back under selling momentum, but not until it is known and confirmed where this um, cut in supply from Iranian oil being turned off will be filled. So this is why over the longer term picture, many still remain negative on oil prices, which is why our everyday viewers, our everyday consumers do not have to worry too much. But over the near term, some geopolitical risk has been priced back into oil. This is why oil prices are rallying. They fit the highest level of 2019. But it's still a dramatic distance away from where oil prices were a couple of years ago. So no need to worry, no need to panic. But we do need to monitor the day-to-day -day news narrative around oil prices and specifically what happens next. It's always what happens next, isn't it? Jamil Ahmed joining us from Kuala Lumpur. Thank you so much for your time. And still ahead on Counting the Cost, why musicians at Iraq's National Symphony Orchestra are trying to hit the right note on pay. Right now, though, the battle, and it really is a battle, over the next generation of mobile technology. On the one side, you've got China's Huawei, loved for its phones, but feared over a perceived threat of Chinese spying, which the company has always said is totally untrue. And on the other side, the likes of Australia, Canada, Denmark, New Zealand and the US, who've all banned the company from their networks. But in the US, there is a really curious tale. It is involving Huawei, a US startup, some so-called unbreakable glass, and an FBI sting operation. John Hendren picks up that story now from Gurney, Illinois. This is a story about a small American technology startup, a giant Chinese conglomerate, and industrial espionage. It starts here in Illinois, where Adam Kahn formed a company, Akon Semiconductor, where they make a kind of glass for cell phones that is said to be six times stronger than the industry standard. So you can drop it and it won't break. And it looks something like that. He was looking for a manufacturer to make it, and among the companies he talked to were Huawei of China. They had a facility in California, so he sent them a sample with two provisions. First, they could not damage it. That's standard protection against industrial espionage. And second, they couldn't take it out of the country because it's made with a kind of industrial diamond-like material that has military properties and is illegal to export from the United States. Nevertheless, it was returned months later and broken. That was when the company thought perhaps they were being ripped off by the Chinese. So they spoke to the FBI, who examined the sample, and determined that it had been cut by a military strength industrial laser. And there were pieces missing, which suggested the Chinese had held on to them to examine it. Then the FBI went one step further. They asked officials at Akon to become spies, to meet with Chinese officials at an industry conference in Las Vegas, which they did wired for sound. Chinese officials there said that, in fact, the sample had been taken to China, and they questioned out loud whether the U.S. government was listening to that conversation. And that is where that case lies. But it's part of a wide-ranging probe into Huawei by companies and the U.S. government. In fact, the CFO of Huawei faces charges in Brooklyn. The company just settled a suit in Washington state where it is alleged to have stolen part of a robot owned by T-Mobile. The robot was called Tappy, by the way. And the Trump administration is urging American companies not to use Huawei's 5G technology. That's because they're afraid that the company is installing a back door that would allow them to listen to Americans and possibly engage in cyber warfare. As for the Akon technology you see here, you might look for it one day soon on a cell phone near you. And we'll have more on that story in the coming weeks here on Counting the Cost because this new mobile technology, 5G as it's known, 
It is coming. It is worth billions. The competition over it is fierce. And Huawei is right at the center of it. As you already see, it is a company which attracts a lot of attention and controversy. Just this week, it came out fighting against allegations that it is funded or controlled in any way by the Chinese government. Reporters in Shenzhen were told there is no state capital in the company at all. Huawei also filed a lawsuit last month against the U.S. government's restrictions on its products, saying Congress has acted unconstitutionally as, quote, judge, jury and executioner. That case is ongoing. It did appear to have a partial victory in the UK, however, where a leaked report indicated Huawei would be used to build some of the UK's new 5G mobile infrastructure, but it would still be excluded from the more sensitive parts of the rollout. And despite all the pressure, the company did report first quarter revenues were up 39% to nearly $27 billion. All goes to show how significant the 5G race is and the concerns about China gaining any first mover advantage. We're going to talk about debt now and the extremely profitable yet morally questionable practice of making money out of bad debts. Now, take the case of Mozambique, one of the world's poorest countries. There is a huge pool of natural gas offshore. But onshore, the country's been on the brink of financial collapse. Mozambique's economy has been reeling from a debt crisis triggered by $2 billion worth of hidden loans that were never approved by its parliament. This was the so-called tuna bond scandal. We've covered it in the past. Money raised to fund a fishing fleet, which never caught any fish, and plunged the country into a crisis. It is now hugely expensive for Mozambique to borrow, and yet it is still borrowing. It owes money to everyone from China to Libya. And for the people living there, it has dire consequences. Not to mention the terrible devastation and loss of life brought by Cyclone Edai recently, which again requires foreign cash to help recover from. Well, Sarah Jane Clifton's joining us now from London. She is the director of the Jubilee Debt Campaign. It's a UK charity working to end poverty caused by unjust debt. It's nice to see you, Sarah Jane. I am going to play devil's advocate here. I'm going to play the part of a modern day capitalist who simply says, this is how it works. The country or the institution which has the money loans to the one that doesn't. It's the way the world goes round. Present the other side of the argument for me. Well, I suppose to some extent we wouldn't necessarily argue with you. We're not opposed to debt. We think it can be useful for both people and countries and businesses to spread the cost of payments for um, large purchases, for countries, things like infrastructure. Um, the issue is if it's commissioned responsibly and spent responsibly, and for countries, whether it's invested productively. So if it's invested in things which can regenerate regener or generate sufficient cash to repay the debt. Um, unfortunately, in the case of Mozambique, this isn't what we saw. Mm. So the secret loans that we were talking about, um, they, uh, it's $2 billion worth, as you said. Um, they weren't declared to Mozambique's parliament. They weren't um, publicly disclosed to the people of Mozambique. And what we found out is that a large amount of the money is believed to have gone missing, um, various of the bank officials involved. And it's important to note that these loans were issued by two London-based banks. Mm -hmm. uh, so some of the, the, the bank officials involved and the government officials involved are now under investigation by US authorities, Swiss authorities, and Mozambique authorities. Let's go back to the point you made about responsibility. Is it a case of there just being more transparency so we can see and everyone can see exactly which money is going where, or is it actually the practices which need to change, or actually is it both? So this is a uh, quite unique case, we think, in relation to Mozambique. We're worried that there are other cases like this, but they just haven't come to light yet because of the secrecy that there is around a, a lot of lending and borrowing. Um, but we think there are kind of there are, there are two issues here really. There's um, the transparency and accountability, but there's also the wider structural issues which are pushing a lot of countries like Mozambique into debt crisis in the first place. So we obviously live in a world which is still very unequal, um, with uh, large amounts of resources concentrated in some countries and not in other countries. We've seen countries in the West not really deliver so far in their commitments to either mobilise enough finance for development for poor countries to help them reach the sustainable development goals or mobilize enough climate finance. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, there has been a bit of progress on tax dodging, but not really enough by any means. So there's still a lot of illicit finance flows out of, of poorer countries, developing countries. So there's still a very strong need for a lot of countries to do debt-based development because there are no other sources of funding available. So actually tackling debt crises in the situation 
that countries like Mozambique find themselves in requires progress on these much bigger structural issues, we believe. But then we also do need to look at the irresponsible and corrupt lending and borrowing that's happening. And we think transparency has to be the starting point for that. So at the moment, there's no obligation on banks um, to actually disclose the money that they're lending to governments. And we're pushing for um, action at the international level, but also in the major global financial centres in the UK and US. And spending it properly. This is the point you made as well before about the likes of infrastructure and the things, actually making sure that the money gets used properly. And I believe your research is showing that it's not in many cases. No, that, that's true. We are seeing a, um, a lot of the borrowing not translate into gains in terms of um, poverty alleviation, investment in public services. Um, but we do think that the, the bigger issue here is the finance gap. It's the lack of development finance available for countries to actually spend um, in, on you know, sustainable development and the fact that they are having to, to borrow as a result. Um, and then how those, those, the debt crises which, are, which are, are appearing, how they're being dealt with by the international institutions. Sarah Jane Clifton, a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Finally this week, Iraq, where musicians at the National Symphony Orchestra are locked in a pay dispute with the government. They haven't seen a paycheck so far this year. Some have left, but those who haven't say they will continue to perform despite the odds. Natasha Ghanem has their story now from Baghdad. A ballet studio with peeling floors, a thick layer of dust and ramshackle chairs is the rehearsal space for the Iraqi National Symphony Orchestra. Somehow, the musicians maintain their focus, seemingly oblivious to the inevitable power cuts that have become common in Iraq. Since last year, the orchestra has been involved in what the conductor calls a war with the Ministry of Culture. The staff hasn't been paid so far this year and spent most of 2018 without a paycheck until they were eventually paid. The staff at the Ministry of Culture acts as if they are living in another world. They are disregarding the fact that the musicians haven't been paid. We have suffered and we are still suffering. There are 110 musicians and support staff with the Iraqi National Symphony Orchestra. Their average salary is $800 a month. Since the pay dispute began last year, 10 members have left. For years, the conductor says the government has attempted to slash the annual $1.4 million budget of the orchestra. Then in 2018, an anti-corruption law was implemented. It banned staff from working a state job and also getting paid to work with the orchestra. Since the 1970s, members had been granted a waiver. I mean, the government should be, you know, supporting us, like, because we are the, the, you know, cultural, you know, front of the whole country. I mean, we're the only symphony orchestra in the country. And we were one of the first symphony orchestras that were established in the Middle East. So, but, you know, of course, they wouldn't consider that, which is really devastating. The Ministry of Culture says it's at the bottom when it comes to federal funding and is struggling to pay for its entire portfolio while reaching an equitable agreement with the musicians. The Ministry of Culture needs to have an inclusive vision for the future of the Iraqi Symphony Orchestra. We need to overcome the outstanding issue in order to rise up with a new talented generation that embraces art and music by all Iraqis. The orchestra has continued to perform this year. To be completely honest with you, we're defiant. We're playing against all odds. The musicians say their passion is fueling them, but they know they can't live on that alone. Natasha Ghanem, Al Jazeera, Baghdad. And that is our show for this week. Do get in touch with us, though. If you've got a comment or a story idea, you can tweet me directly at Kamal AJE and the hashtag AJCTC. Or you can email the team directly, counting the cost at aljazeera.net. And a special mention to our editor, Maria Daly. After three years with us and five at Al Jazeera, she is on to pastures new. And Maria, we wish you all the best with your next venture. You can also check us out online at aljazeera.com slash CTC. That'll take you straight to our page, which has individual reports, links, and entire episodes for you to catch up on whenever you like. 
But that is it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Kamal Santa Maria from the whole team. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next. <laughs>